I'm Sam Rodriguez, the wingman to the one and only Ken Harrison, president and CEO of Promise Keepers. We have discussed so many of not just the emerging, but the relevant conversational pieces impacting culture and society. The, the, the objective of Daring Faith is to push back on that admonition, if not outline, from the book of Revelation, which surprises many people, that cowards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Wow, right? And we're looking for daring faith, not militant faith, not cuckoo for Cocoa Puff faith, but beautiful orthodoxy, righteousness and justice, truth and love, Psalm 89, 14. That's, that's daring faith. Today's conversation, I'm super psyched. Ken, please guide us. You have a special guest. We have a special guest. We just don't want to offer a counterculture narrative. We want to be light in the midst of darkness and elevate truth with love. And today is one super episode with a special guest, Ken Harrison. Take it away, please. Yeah, one of the things we're fighting against all the time is this idea that in a church everybody has to conform and we have to control people, right? That's the world's narrative. And some Christians get caught up in that. And we, we can't forget that Christians come from everywhere. All of us are sinners. All of us were born in sin. And by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have put our faith in him, right? So the, the, the king of the universe has come and died for our sins. And he has said, I only have one requirement. That is that you believe in me. And in, in most cultures, and other languages, believe and obey are sort of the same word. So how do we respond to people who think differently than we do? And in Promise Keepers, we deal with race all the time. So we, we deal with, you know, reconciliation and all that stuff. But I think also we need to deal with people who walk a different road than we have, and we need to learn and listen from other people's experiences. And so I've had my experience raised in rural Oregon by an XLA cop, right? You had your experiences raised in Pennsylvania. Right. Your experiences led you to a weird way where you're like a – Trekkie guy that's just weird. This is true. But I still love you, man. The Evangelical Trekkie Association. <laughs> so um, Becca Cook and I have become really good friends, and Becca definitely has a different um, road that he's walked towards salvation. And um, I've come to have a huge respect for him, not the least because Beckett went to uh, Biola Talbot Seminary, which is a, I really respect those guys. And, uh, and I read his book, and it's just a phenomenal book about his experience. And so... Beck, I just wanted you to kind of run us through um, your experience, and because I think by by giving us your story, it's really going to bring up a lot of other conversation points. It'll be really fascinating. Yeah, thank you guys for having me on. I uh, so when I was very young, I think I was in I don't know fifth fifth grade, maybe fourth grade. I started to realize I grew up in Dallas, Texas the youngest of eight kids and a giant family. Uh, and I started to realize that I was attracted to the same sex, which was very disconcerting, um, especially back then when it was very, very much taboo, very forbidden, uh, especially according to my family who were Christians, commit, you know, serious, serious Christians. Um, According to my peers, it was very much forbidden and uh, taboo. And according to society in general, it was not accepted. So, so I had to lead this sort of double life. And in through through elementary school, kind of into seventh and eighth grade, I you know I went steady with girls, all the while knowing that I wasn't you know attracted to girls, but I, you know, I, I was very social in school. I was very popular and I went to, I went steady with girls, but I had this kind of deep, dark secret inside, but things shifted in high school. I went to a Jesuit high school in Dallas and, and it's an all boys school. And I, when I, when I was a Jesuit, I met, when I was a junior, I met a sophomore who was basically go, going through the same thing I was. We were both same sex attracted. We became super close friends. And then it, like a few months into our friendship, maybe, I don't know, five to six months into our friendship, we came out to each other, uh, which shifted everything into high gear. Because once we came out to each other, we started, we, we were partners in crime. And so we, we started going to gay bars in Dallas. I was 15. He was 14. I don't know how we got into these bars. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it was the, the 80s it was the 80s <laughs> you know it was every anything goes but 
I remember just walking into this nightclub in Dallas called the Stark Club. It was a very kind of big deal. And it, and it was designed by Philippe Stark, the famous French designer. And it was uh, owned by, partly owned by Grace Jones, Stevie Nicks. And it was this really beautiful nightclub. And it was, there were gays, there were, you know, straight people, there were trans people, or like, at that time, there was more like trans vestites, really. It was not, it was less transsexuals, if that makes sense. And, um, and I remember just walking in and just seeing this kind of whole mix of people and thinking, wow, like, these are my people. Like, this is, these people get what I'm going through. Because, again, in high school, I was still, you know, definitely in the closet. And I, and so, and again, in high school, I dated, I went, I mean, I dated girls in high school. I dated three girls that they were the most beautiful girls at the girl school. And I dated them and we, it was like serious. It was a serious relationships I had, but I, it was kind of like this fake situation because I knew I wasn't attracted to them. And so um, and, you know, and in high school, I would go to proms and debutante balls and and to all these different kind of functions with these girls. But then, then afterwards, after the, <laughs> the balls were over, uh, my best friend and I would sneak off to the gay bars downtown, you know, near downtown. And so I, it was this serious double life I was leading, and no one really was the wiser including my parents, because my parents were, um, you know, they, by the time they got to me, I was the eighth child. They, they were just exhausted. They didn't really have time to keep up with yeah, me. I was know, making straight A's enough. in school. They, I, they, I had so much kind of freedom to move around the cabin. You know, I, I there was no restrictions on me. I had no curfew for better, or for worse. And, um, and my parents never really knew where I was. Um, in fact, one time I went to Acapulco for a weekend and they had no idea that I was out of town for the weekend. Like, oh, I mean, wow. this, is, this, is the, wow. <laughs> this is the wow. extent to which my parents were completely uh, clueless. Um, and then it, same thing happened in college. I, I ended up becoming best friends with somebody who was same sex attracted. We uh, were able to, you know, confide in each other and it was great to have someone in high school and in college that I could confide in. And um, we did the same thing. We explored gay culture together. We went to gay bars. We talked about our feelings, you know, and then again, but, but I still wasn't out of the closet. And also at that time, I didn't think my homosexuality was like a lifelong thing for me. I thought, oh, this is kind of just what's happening now. It's a phase sort of I'm going through and, you know, eventually I'm going to get married, have a, have a wife and kids. But for now, this is what I want. Like I, the heart wants what it wants, as Emily Dickinson says, like, so I am, I just pursued that. That's what, that's what I was feeling. And that's what I was pursuing. And then it didn't, it didn't become my identity until after college, when I moved to Tokyo for a year uh, with my best friend. And we were both we were both figuring out what we wanted to do with our lives. I had been accepted into grad schools. He didn't know what he wanted to do. And he was like, let's just, but I felt ambivalent about the grad school situation. I didn't want to be a lawyer really. <laughs> and, um, and so we decided to move to Tokyo and just to kind of give ourselves some time to figure things out. And while we were in Japan, his friend from Texas came to visit us in our tiny little apartment in Tokyo. And uh, he stayed with us. We'll call him Adam. Adam stayed with us for a week. And by the end of that week, we had fallen in love. And that was the first time I had experienced that. And it, it was the first time I'd, I'd had, because and we got into a relationship immediately. And so it was the first time I had a boyfriend. And so once that happened, I I was all in. I was like, this is definitely who I am. This is my identity. It's immutable. And I was all in, in for it. And, um, and so I came out to my family. Well, I came out to all my friends and family, but my, my family already knew because 
<laughs> my sister had written me a letter while I was in Japan asking if I was gay. She had her suspicions for a while. And I wrote her back saying, yes, blah, blah, blah. P.S. Please don't tell mom and dad. I'll tell them when I get home. But she immediately, of course, ran to my parents and told them the second she received nice. the letter. Before she even opened the letter, she told them. And so I was actually happy she did that because I didn't have to do the the heavy. I didn't have to do that awkward moment of mom, dad, sit down. I have to tell you something like I that was it was already done for me. So when I got home, my parents knew everyone in my family knew. And my my parents reaction was extraordinary. The way they responded was, in my opinion, it, it was the best possible scenario. Um, the night after I got home, I walked into the kitchen. My mother, my mother, her usual spot was just sitting at the kitchen table. Uh, and so she, I walked into the kitchen and my mother and I were very close, Kel Surprise. And um, I walked in and she, I was getting some food or something and I... I notice she start she starts crying and I know why she's crying because I know she knows. And so right. I turned to her and I said, mom, what's wrong? And she said, well, I heard you're homosexual. And, and, and she started just weeping and I knew, and I, I knew she was terrified because at that time, this was 1992, 91, 92. And, um, uh, AIDS was very much of a right. death sentence and it was very scary. I was terrified of it. She was terrified. And, um, and I just tried to allay her fears. And I said, mom, it's not a big deal. Like, don't worry about me. This is just who I am. And I kind of tried to tell sort of convey to her that I wasn't, I don't, I, well, what I do know is she interpreted what I said to her as, I wasn't really going to pursue that life. So I don't know how that got lost in translation, but, but she was very sweet. And, and, and then the next day, my father, who is such a man's man. And uh, he came up to me and said, Hey, Beck, I, I heard, I heard you're um, a homosexual. And, and is there anything I did wrong as a father? I mean, are you mad at me for, you know, X, Y, and Z, or are you mad that I didn't spend more time with you as a kid? Are you mad that, you know, I didn't protect you from your brothers, you know, bullying you or whatever? Are you mad that, um, I forgot the, uh, the third thing, but he, he listed those things and I said, no. And I didn't want negative kind of experiences of my childhood to be related to my new identity as a gay man. So I, I immediately kind of shut him down. I was like, no, dad, it's not your fault. This is nothing to, like, this is just who I am. Of course, it turns out it probably <laughs> was his fault. <laughs> he was a very distant father. Uh, I mean, again, he had no time for, you know, all of his eight children. So, so, so Becky, can I, can I jump in? I, I never like introduce, uh, you know, interrupting stories, but I do, I know there are certain questions burning in people's minds as they listen to this. And so the first one is, and you've written about this a lot in, in your book, um, about your identity. So you're now, you're now transitioning to the point where you went from same sex attracted to identifying and that you talk about, that's a major point difference, right? Number one. And then number two, of course, the, the question everyone's asking, which you and I have talked about quite a bit is, did you, do you feel like you chose to be gay or do you feel like you're born gay? So those are the two questions I'll throw out there to kind of, because I know it, everyone's going to be wondering about those as you go through your story. I might as well get them out there now. Yeah. So, I mean, I, but the reason I took on that identity is because of that, that moment of falling in love with that guy. So that's when it transitioned to an identity uh, rather than just a, a kind of, kind of a fleeting sort of desire, same sex attraction thing. That's when it really yeah, that's when it became my identity is because that it was because of that, that moment of, because I, I just thought, you know, this is the best thing in the world. And this is, it was no longer something kind of like shameful, something I wanted to deny or get rid of. It was something I wanted to fully embrace because of this guy. And so um, that, that had a, that had a big, big impact on, on it becoming my identity. And then the in terms of 
why I think I developed same sex attraction. The answer is who knows? I mean, it's really such an enigma because there's three main sort of theories. One is um, a genetic predisposition, genetic predisposition. Number two, hormonal in utero. So like maybe as a, in, you know, when I was in my mother's womb, I got too much progesterone or not a, something like some imbalance of hormones. Um, and the third is environmental. So like overbearing mother, distant father. Plus I was molested when I was nine years old. When I was nine, I um, spent the night at a classmate's house. And in the middle of the night, I woke up to his father um, molesting me. And however, I have to say this because this is so key because people assume because of, because of that molestation that that's why I'm gay. But I specifically remember before that, even before that night, I was already starting to develop same-sex attraction. So, uh, so I don't know if that that night kind of pushed me all the way in to that or not. I don't know how. I mean, it definitely affected me. I still feel the effects today because it. It was a very, when, when, when you're sexually abused as a child, it does a number on you and it stays with you forever. I mean, it's, it's, it was such a scary night. I thought he was going to murder me. Um, so it, it still like is kind of reverberating today in my life. It just still is sort of there. Um, but so the answer is, I don't know why I, it definitely mm -hmm. wasn't a choice. I didn't choose to be same. I mean, obviously I wouldn't choose to be same sex attracted in a world, especially back then when it was like completely, you know, frowned upon and completely forbidden. Why would I even want to be, I wouldn't want that. And in fact, mm -hmm. when it first started to happen, I, I wanted I wanted to be a normal person. I wanted to be a normal guy and like be friends with all the guys and like go, you know, I I wanted to have that normal life. And so for whatever reason, however this came about, that that same sex attraction robbed me of so many things, including a family, a wife and a kids mm -hmm. later on in life. So let me make two two questions, two points real quickly. So first one is um we have seen here at Promise Keepers that a lot of men who were sexually abused by men, which is almost always the case, um, do do experience same-sex attraction. A lot of times they don't end up becoming gay, but they, they do struggle with that their whole lives. And so I just want to, some people are watching this right now. There, there are guys who are in the church who are married who yep. are watching this, and they're watching it specifically because they've experienced same-sex attraction and then they feel shame or whatever. And I, it, that's why it's so important to get your story out there, Beckett. And number, number two, I knew your answer because we had talked about it before. Um, I think it's important here that we don't argue with people about what we don't know. So when when gay people say they were born that way, no one knows how they were born. I, I remember having crushes on girls when I was like five, but I don't remember how I felt when I was three, right? So I can't I can't tell you I was born heterosexual. My 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 earliest memories I remember being heterosexual, but all people are born with a sinful nature. And all of us have things to overcome. And if you're, you know, an American Indian, you're born likely with a more proclivity for being an alcoholic, right? If you um, have certain genetic things, you're born with proclivities. Jesus Christ came to die for the sins of all men. And all of us were born with sinful natures. And some, you know, some, hey, there are people out there that they say 2% of the population has no sexual attraction at all. So they don't struggle with sex. So it's easy for them to look down on people who do struggle with sexual sin and feel superior. They're not superior. They just weren't born with certain desires. So it's important that we don't engage in things we don't know about. It's okay to say, I don't know. Totally. And you, Beckett, having walked in those shoes and me not having walked in them, you don't know, I don't know. It's just we live in a twisted, broken world. And thank God that the Lord Jesus Christ saved you. So let me ask you a question here, Beckett. Well, well stated. So genetic predisposition could be a hormonal shift as it pertains to balances or environmental, right? That that may arguably be the framework or the rubric. Better yet, you referenced the fact that you were raised in a very religious home, the eighth 
child, right? Throughout your journey, did you ever find your faith to be incompatible with your inclinations, your desires? Or did the faith element, was it so de minimis as it pertains to intellectual, emotional impact that it, did, it became a non-factor? Well, I grew up in the Catholic Church, so it was a, a bit of a different sort of um, situation because because it was it was very simple to just go to mass on Sundays, and it was like you do your thing and you go to mass and you leave, and then you don't think about it. And but as I grew older into high school, a God was not even on my radar. I was gotcha. so focused on my burgeoning sexuality, my kind of that God wasn't even, I, I didn't even believe in God. So God was irrelevant to my life because I, and I was happy that that was the case because I knew that, and I knew it was incompatible. I knew that being gay and being a Christian was incompatible. Um, I already knew that. So I was happy to have God completely off my radar because I wanted to pursue what I wanted to pursue. And I, and so God became more and more as I got older, just a much more kind of faint, distant idea that, and then eventually it became a situation where I just didn't ever even think about God. So we have about four minutes left. You take us to Los Angeles. And then when we, to the next week's episode, we'll pick up with you becoming a Christian and then go from there. I moved to LA after, after Tokyo, long story. I moved to LA to uh, pursue acting and writing. And, and when I got here, I had a whole group of friends that was just amazing set of friends. There were straight people, gay people. It was just, and they were all from these, you know, Ivy league school. They were from Brown and Princeton, basically from the East coast. And so were they, they were all super smart, ambitious, funny, very, very funny people. And they were all in the business. They were writers, producers, actors, directors. And I got to watch, I mean, in real time, I watched my friends become superstars overnight. I mean, Minnie Driver was a very close friend. She wasn't a known actress. And then she did Goodwill Hunting with Matt Damon and then became super famous. And we watch, like we all watched that overnight. And like Lisa Loeb was a close friend and she had that song, Stay. Lisa actually went to... Uh, she was, she went to the girls school in Dallas. Uh, so I knew her from high school, but, um, we were friends out here and she, so like, this was happening to all my friends and, um, and, you know, Mariska Hargitay, who's on law and order special victims unit. She was Jane Mansfield's daughter. And she was kind of did a few things on, you know, t she did like guest star things on like Seinfeld and a couple other things. But, you know, otherwise she wasn't really known. And and then I drove her to her audition for Law and Order Special Victims Unit. I drove with her to run lines with her. And um, I was her best gay, as she would call me. <laughs> <laughs> and then she ended up getting booking the, the lead part in Law and Order Special Victims Unit. And 23 years later, she's still on the show. So she owes me some royalties. But um, <laughs> we're still friends. But uh, and, and then I, you know, in L.A., I had just like these extraordinary experiences. I would hang out at drew barrymore's house i would hang out i went to prince's house where he performed a concert in his backyard for three hours i uh i would hang out at paris hilton's house um and i and i knew everyone i would go to all the award shows the oscars the emmys the golden globes the grammys the after parties the vanity fair parties the hbo parties the governor's ball after the oscars where i had dinner with tom hanks and meryl streep and i i just i i went to so many i had you know, dinner with Pierce Brosnan and his wife and like at, at uh, Sean Hayes's house, who was the guy on uh, Will and Grace, one of the guys, Jack. Uh, I think it was at his house, but um, no, actually it was at, I'm sorry. It was at uh, my big crack Greek wedding. The, I forgot, Nia Vardalis's house, uh, which was right near Sean's house in Hancock park. So I, I just knew everyone. I was friends with everyone. And so I had all this kind of, I had all these shiny objects around me, distracting me for a long, long time. And, and I thought that was life, life. This is what life is all about. Like having these amazing experiences, finding true love. I, I cycled through five serious boyfriends over the years. Um, 
and, you know, making it big in Hollywood, which, you know, I was, you know, trying to do, I was acting in a bunch of commercials. I was writing pilots, TV pilots. Um, but, but then I ended up becoming a production designer for the remainder of my time. And, and so, um, I was living this life. I was living this very sort of, um, very, very LA life. And, uh, and I was very, I was always invited to fashion weeks in New York and Paris. And I was just invited to parties all the time. And so I was in this sort of glamorous world. And then eventually the law of diminishing returns set in and it was kind of like, is that all there is? Wow. So I want to leave it right there, right there. Cause we, I want to, you're going to come back next week and we're going to talk about you are at the height of the dream. You are totally living in the world, knowing the celebrities. You're in LA. You got it all going for you. And now you're just starting to go, well, maybe this isn't all there is. So when we come back for next week's episode. I want to talk about your conversion. And then I want to talk to you specifically about how we as Christians relate to and love the homosexual community. What does that mean? Because we, we hear this all the time. How do we love homosexual people in the truth and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? So uh, I, I, I love this conversion story. It's awesome, and I can't wait to get to it. Daring faith, righteousness and justice, truth and love. We don't lean. We stand. See you next week.